Every day we coexist with evil. We witness the darkest side of human behavior. The suffering caused by one individual to others is something inherent in our society. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Luke, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Case of Stephanie Bennett Stephanie Bennett was born on August 30, 1979, in the small American town of Rocky Mount, Virginia. After her parents divorced during her childhood, Stephanie lived with her mother. Despite the divorce, her father lived nearby, and Stephanie would see him nearly every day. Later on, her father remarried, giving Stephanie a stepsister named Diana. Upon finishing high school, Stephanie attended Roanoke College, which was 350 kilometers from her home. In her senior year, she met a young man named Walter, and they started dating. After college, the couple split but continued their relationship even as they moved to different cities. Stephanie moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, alongside her stepsister Diana and a mutual friend named Emily. The three shared an apartment in the Bridgeport residential complex located in a quiet, peaceful area on the outskirts of the city. Stephanie secured a job at IBM while her boyfriend moved to Greenville, South Carolina, to pursue an engineering degree. After living in Raleigh for about a year, and with Stephanie recently having turned 23, she, her stepsister, and her friend were planning to relocate to different cities. Stephanie intended to move to Greenville to be with Walter, and the couple had already begun looking for a place to live together. In May, Stephanie visited Greenville, where she and Walter viewed several apartments and chose one suitable for them. Upon her return to Raleigh, she found that Emily had moved to another city and Diana had left for a few days to attend a funeral. On the night of May 20, Stephanie came home from work and spoke on the phone with Walter, who was to fax her the lease agreement for the new apartment for her signature. They agreed that Walter would send it the following day when Stephanie could use the fax machine at her workplace. The next day, Walter was unable to reach Stephanie by phone, either at work or at home. After several unsuccessful attempts and Stephanie failing to show up for work, her friends and family became concerned and contacted the police. When the police arrived at her apartment, they found Stephanie deceased on the floor of her bedroom. Upon finding identification documents and confirming through a photograph, they identified Stephanie as the victim. Investigators noted a dirty clothes hamper under the window of Emily's bedroom, which had been moved. They surmised that the killer could have entered the apartment through the window. Additionally, they found the home phone in Emily's bedroom closet with its cord cut, suggesting the perpetrator had hidden there and disabled the phone to prevent the victim from using it. After speaking with Diana, the police learned that several items were missing from the apartment. The perpetrator had taken $8 from Stephanie's wallet, two recorders, and the clothes hamper from Stephanie's room, presumably to carry the stolen items. Forensic experts found DNA evidence on the victim and took a sample, but it did not match any records in the FBI database. The cause of death was determined to be asphyxiation. Notably, the murder weapon was not found at the scene, leading to the belief that the killer had taken it. Investigators interviewed other residents of the apartment complex, hoping someone might have seen the killer. During these interviews, it came to light that for several months, residents have reported someone lurking around and peeping through windows of the complex. The manager was questioned, but the complex administration could not locate the suspect. Notably, at least once, this individual was seen at Stephanie's window. Moreover, a few months before, an unknown man attacked a woman jogging near the lake by the complex. After this incident, Stephanie was scared to stay alone in her apartment and wished to move to Greenville as soon as possible. 
Investigators examined the complex's surroundings and found something peculiar. In the bushes, they discovered several dozen women's underwear, later identified as belonging to Stephanie. The police theorized that the murderer might have taken these from the apartment, but then discarded them in the bushes for some reason. However, this theory was soon disproved. It turned out that a teenager living in the adjacent apartment regularly entered Stephanie's room and stole her underwear, then discarded them in the bushes. The young man admitted this when questioned by investigators, but denied any involvement in the murder. His DNA did not match the sample from the crime scene, so he was no longer considered a suspect. The police thought that the man who had been spying on women through the apartment windows was the most obvious candidate for the murder. After speaking with everyone who had seen this man, the detectives created a composite sketch and published it in the newspapers, but without success. As standard procedure, investigators checked Stephanie's boyfriend, who voluntarily provided a DNA sample that did not match the murderers. Additionally, at the time of the murder, Walter was several hundred kilometers away and could not physically have been at the scene. Subsequently, the police asked all the men in the complex to voluntarily provide a DNA sample. This also yielded no results. No match was found among the 283 DNA profiles received, and at this point, there were no significant leads. Detectives organized surveillance of the apartment complex in hopes of catching the man who had been spying on residents. To their surprise, they soon succeeded. On June 3, Police observed a man approaching several ground floor windows and looking inside the homes. While at one of the windows, this man began to masturbate and the police immediately arrested him. This individual turned out to be Christopher Lee, who had been convicted multiple times for peeping and stalking women, including a three-year prison sentence for harassment in 2000. The detectives thought they had finally caught the killer, but were disappointed. Christopher's DNA did not match the sample found on Stephanie's body. He was charged with peeping but was no longer considered a suspect in the murder. The police continued working on the case without any significant leads. A year later, the lead detective heard about a lab in Florida that could determine a person's ethnic ancestry based on their DNA. Despite doubts about this technology, he did not want to miss an opportunity so he sent the DNA of four of his colleagues of different ethnic backgrounds as a test. The experts completed the task with 100% accuracy, and the detective then submitted the killer's DNA from Stephanie's case. At the lab, they determined that the DNA owner was Caucasian, but this information did not significantly aid the police. In August 2003, the victim's father offered a $100,000 reward for any information leading to the capture of the killer. Stephanie's mother wrote a letter published in local newspapers, imploring people to share any information with the police that could help identify the suspect. This generated some new leads, but they led nowhere. In April 2004, based on numerous witness accounts, the detectives decided to re-interview all residents of the complex. They learned that the man arrested for peeping might not be the only one lurking around the complex buildings and looking through others' windows. Having identified the first man and possessing his photos, the investigators wanted to speak again with residents who had seen a man spying around. Unfortunately, none had seen his face. He often appeared during the dark hours, wearing a hood over his head. Some witnesses mentioned they had seen him without a hood, but could only make out his long hair. Detectives interviewed dozens of individuals until they finally found someone who had seen this person near Stephanie Bennett's window before her murder. This witness already had given a statement to the police, but now remembered something else. He saw the man a few days after the incident. The man was walking his dog near a wooded area behind the residential complex, recognizable by his hoodie. The witness watched the man until he disappeared among the trees with his Labrador. It seemed the witness had either forgotten this detail or hadn't thought it related to the murder, so the police didn't have this information during the initial interrogations. Two years after Stephanie's death, detectives learned they should be looking for a man with a Labrador who, since he walked the dog in that area, likely lived nearby. 
Detectives found an interesting fact. There was another residential complex behind the wooded area where the man was spotted. Assuming the dog owner might live there, the police inquired with the complex staff if they knew of a man with a Labrador. They were immediately given the name Drew Planton, a 35-year-old regarded as somewhat odd by complex employees. He was described as reclusive, hardly speaking to anyone, never making eye contact, and always wearing loose-fitting clothing, presumably to avoid drawing attention to himself. Upon further investigation, they spoke with an elderly resident who kept an eye on the complex's goings-on. When told they were investigating Stephanie Bennett's murder, she expressed surprise that no one had been arrested, mentioning that boy with the big dog as a known figure. The residents had suspected this man, but had not reported their suspicions to the police. Drew had since moved elsewhere in the city. The detectives attempted to contact him at his new apartment, but received no response despite repeated visits at various times. While searching for Drew, the police interviewed his neighbors who shared alarming details. A woman living above him saw Drew with a young man shortly after Stephanie's murder, and Drew was reportedly telling the young man not to talk to the police. This led investigators to believe that the young man might have been involved in the theft of undergarments from the victim's apartment. Other women had felt menaced by Drew. They observed him while jogging or in secluded places, watching closely or even following them. Unable to contact Drew at home, detectives found his workplace and approached him there. Drew, a chemist in a fertilizer production lab, denied knowledge of Stephanie Bennett's murder which was odd considering his close proximity to the crime scene. He was uncooperative, but agreed to answer questions at his home at a scheduled time. When detectives met with him at his apartment, he denied ever walking his dog near Stephanie's complex. Given the numerous witnesses who had seen him in the area, the detectives immediately suspected he was lying. He also claimed not to wear glasses, contrary to his driver's license information and witness descriptions of a man peering into apartment windows wearing glasses. Predictably, Drew refused to voluntarily provide a DNA sample. The detectives decided to surveil him in hopes of obtaining a DNA sample by other means, but this proved challenging as he left no items behind that could be analyzed in a lab. For example, during lunchtime, he would leave work, sit in his car, and simply stare at a fixed point. Didn't the man eat anything? As a result, detectives were unable to retrieve any object with his DNA. Detectives observed as Drew discarded an empty water bottle into a trash container. They retrieved it and took it to the laboratory. However, the experts were unable to obtain a DNA sample from it. According to one account, Drew deliberately took a clean bottle and threw it away on the street, knowing he was under surveillance. After that, the police decided to try and obtain his trash, but they also failed in this endeavor. For several days, they never saw him take out the trash. Notably, the man's neighbors also couldn't recall ever seeing him with a trash bag. Later, the investigators sought assistance from Drew's boss. She agreed to help them obtain an item from his workplace that might contain his DNA. She observed him for several days, but was never able to retrieve any object. Drew rarely ate at work, never discarded anything, and not a single hair could be found in his office. Given that the man had long hair, this seemed odd. The investigators were already convinced that Drew was meticulously eliminating any traces so they couldn't obtain his DNA. Once, the boss saw him pick up his hair and tie it with an elastic band. After that, he meticulously picked up any strands that had fallen to the floor. Then the woman decided to invite him to lunch at a cafe to supposedly discuss some work matters. But even there, the man was extremely cautious. Eating mostly with his hands, he stored all used napkins in his pocket and even took the straw and the glass with his drink. For dessert, he ordered banana pudding and Drew finally used a fork. However, after using it, he cleaned the fork with a damp napkin for 15 minutes eliminating any possibility of obtaining a DNA sample from the utensil. Despite this, the investigators took the fork and brought it to the laboratory. 
The experts were able to find small DNA samples that showed a partial match with the DNA at the crime scene of Stephanie Bennett. However, the result was too inconclusive as more biological material was needed for a complete comparison. In the end, the detectives obtained a search warrant for Drew's workplace, hoping to find an item containing his DNA. The investigators were also concerned that the man might flee once he realized they were executing the search warrant, so they decided to conduct it at night. Among the suspect's belongings, they found gloves he was supposed to use while working with chemicals. The detectives suspected that his DNA might be inside the gloves, so they took them and replaced them with another pair. They still feared that Drew might flee if he realized the police had his DNA. Experts found biological material inside the gloves, and the DNA analysis showed a complete match. Finally, the detectives were confident that Drew was responsible for the murder of Stephanie Bennett and had undeniable evidence in their hands. On October 18, 2005, the police quietly surrounded the laboratory where the man worked and waited for him to exit. The investigators feared that attempting to arrest him inside the building might lead to him taking a colleague as a hostage or attacking them. These fears were not unfounded, as when the man left the building, they immediately arrested him. They found a loaded firearm in his possession, indicating he was well aware that the police were close to capturing him and had no intention of surrendering easily. During the interrogation, which lasted more than six hours, Drew did not say a word, refused food and water, and barely moved. In the end, detectives had to place him in a wheelchair to move him around. With a search warrant for his apartment, the investigators found a stash of stolen clothing belonging to Stephanie. Additionally, they discovered nine pistols, two rifles, 40 knives, a pair of handcuffs, and a machete. They also found lock-picking tools and handcuffs. The detectives came across a notebook with dozens of women's names, which they immediately started to trace to ensure their safety. It turned out that one of the women was the same resident of his apartment complex who had complained about Drew during the interrogation. She said that the man watched her on the street, and she felt consistently uncomfortable. Her fears were confirmed when the police found her underwear and tampons in Drew's house. Moreover, there was a copy of her high school graduation videotape. It turned out that Drew had entered her apartment, taken the tape, made a copy, and returned it. All this time, he had kept these items even after moving. In his apartment, they also found a check made out to the woman who was murdered in 1999. The investigators discovered that at that time, Drew lived in the same city. Additionally, the woman had been killed with a firearm of a quite rare caliber. But it was precisely that weapon, found in the man's collection during the search, that made Drew a suspect in this case. However, he first had to stand trial for the murder of Stephanie Bennett. A month after his arrest, the prosecution officially announced that they would seek the death penalty. The trial was set to begin the following year, and Drew spent that time in solitary confinement, but the trial never took place. On January 1, 2006, Drew was found dead in his cell, despite all the precautions that were in place. The investigators had no doubt that Drew had killed Stephanie Bennett, but after searching his house, the inevitable question arose, how many other victims might this person have had? At the very least, it was probable that he had been behind the murder of a woman in 1999. The detectives were almost certain that Drew might have been involved in other crimes as well. After carefully studying his background, the police uncovered several interesting details. Drew was raised in a complete family with three siblings. His father constantly humiliated and beat the children until their mother fled with them to another state. As a result, Drew became a very introverted teenager, a trait that intensified over time. Despite this, he received a good education and found a decent job as a chemist. His colleagues said that he was very intelligent, but his social skills were practically non-existent. He had no friends, did not talk to anyone at work, and always tried to keep as far away from the group as possible. Interestingly, Drew's biological brother also had a criminal record. 
He spied on women with a hidden camera and received a suspended sentence. In 2008, Drew's mother sued the state government, accusing the authorities of allowing her son's death. However, the judge concluded that the prison guards had taken all necessary precautions and could not have stopped the man. Stephanie Bennett's father tried to sue the management of the apartment complex for ignoring residents' reports of a man who was spying, as well as for not paying enough attention to the safety of residents on the premises. According to him, there was insufficient lighting around the buildings in the dark, and anyone could walk there unnoticed. He also found out that the window of his daughter's apartment was broken, but the complex's management did not rush to fix this problem, despite it being their direct duty. In the end, however, he withdrew these accusations without commenting on his decision. Thus, this complex and puzzling case was finally resolved. The police still wonder today how many other victims might Drew have had. The available information suggests that the man was prone to committing serial crimes, but after his death, it became practically impossible to know the truth. And that's the end of today's case. As always, I appreciate your support for my work. If you subscribe, like, and share this video, it will help me continue creating content. This was another episode of Unreal True Crime. See you soon.